Our series of lectures will be moderated by my colleague from UCD School of Education and a member of Peritia Consortium, Dr. Shane Bergen. Dr. Bergen is a physicist by training and a science communicator by uh, vocation. We also look forward to a series of podcasts based on themes from these lectures that Dr. Bergen will be preparing over the next several months. Links to this podcast will be made available in due course. Today's lecture is by one of the most influential currently writers on uh, the epistemology of politics, uh, Professor Kasim Kassam, who has written uh, a, a most illuminating book on conspiracy theories. Dr. Bergen now will introduce Professor Kassam. Thank you very much, Maria, and uh, welcome to everybody. Indeed, as Maria said, welcome to the second of the Peritia public lecture series on truths, trust in an age of disinformation. And as Maria said, my name is Shane Bergen and I'll be your host for the next hour. So truth and trust are becoming contentious topics for science and democracy. Conspiracy theories, as we'll see today, disrupt political elections. Disinformation campaigns target scientific consensus around things like climate change, and as we know in 2021, on vaccines. And indeed, anti-elite populism overshadows public debates. It's quite common now. In the midst of a pandemic, citizens such as you may find themselves asking quintessential philosophical questions. What is truth? Whom can we trust? And who indeed, and indeed, how can we trust them? So, our lecture series is delving into these phenomena to explore the concepts of trust and truth in light of current events. And as Maria said, today's lecture, Misunderstanding Conspiracy Theories, is by Professor Kasim Kassam, who's the Professor of Philosophy at the University of Warwick. Professor Kassam is a Kantian scholar and is the author of six books on a range of subjects, including self-knowledge, perception, intellectual vices, and today's topic, conspiracy theories. Earlier, Professor Kassam informed us that on September 1st, he will have a new publication on extremism, a philosophical analysis. We look forward to reading it. The blurb on his book of today's topic, a wonderful book that I can't recommend highly enough, Conspiracy Theories, states that conspiracy theories are so often smoke screens over political ends. And as such, we need to come up with political as well as intellectual responses if we are to have any hope of defeating them. So we look forward today to learning a little bit more on how and why we can clear that smoke around conspiracy theories. In a moment, I'll hand over to Professor Kassam for his, uh, for his presentation, after which there will be plenty of time for you to pose questions uh, to him. Indeed, if you, if you feel compelled to write a question during uh, the talk, you can do so using the questions and answers button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to as many of those as possible. We were inundated at the last lecture with, with over 50 questions from, from the audience, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and we would encourage that level of, of interaction today as well. I would encourage that you also try to keep your questions brief as I have to do the, the, the trick of, of listening to uh, the speaker and, and being polite in doing so um, and being curious as to what they're going to say, but also at the same time, sifting through the wonderful questions that you're posing to pick something that will, will add on to the current conversation and, and keep it going. So if you can be brief, that would be wonderful, but we look forward to interesting questions from you. So it's over to you, Professor Kassam. Now we look forward to your talk and we will uh, all see you shortly. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Shane, and thank you, Maria, for the invitation to this event. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, so my talk is called Misunderstanding Conspiracy Theories. Uh, and the reason it, it's called that is that it seems to me that a lot of the existing literature on conspiracy theories, both philosophical and psychological literature, misses uh, what seems to me to be a couple of fairly obvious points about uh, conspiracy theories. And um, that's the, the case I'll be making uh, in today's um, presentation. So um, I'm going to uh, now attempt to share my screen with you um, and uh, hopefully um, you will be able to see this in a second. Um, if you can't, then please uh, let me know. Um, so let me just start by identifying 
what I take to be the key questions about conspiracy theories. Uh, so the first one is, what is a conspiracy theory? So that's, I suppose, a definitional question. Then there's a kind of psychological, um, a third question is, what, if anything, is wrong with conspiracy theories? Uh, and the last question is how we should, was about how we should respond um, to conspiracy theories. Um, so I'm gonna say quite a bit about the first question, um, a little bit about the second question, um, and a little bit less about the remaining two questions. But I think the first question is actually kind of quite a fundamental test um, for, for, for all of you who are tuning in to this. Uh, and I call it the 9-11 test. So as all of you will know, there are lots of different perspectives on the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington in, in 2001. So one theory about 9-11 is the inside job theory. So the inside job theory says that the 9-11 attacks were carried out by individuals working on behalf of elements inside the government. Um, is the official report of the 9-11 commission, um, which carried out extensive investigations into the attacks themselves and the planning leading up to these attacks. And the basic conclusion of the report was the 9-11 attacks were the responsibility of a group of conspirators working on behalf of Al-Qaeda. So the report goes into great detail about um, who um, was the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks and how uh, he masterminded them and so on and, and, and so forth. Okay, so let's just look at these two uh, accounts, two theories, if you like to call them theories about 9-11. So here's my question. Are both of these, now, what I wanna suggest is, is, is the following. My intuition is that when people talk about conspiracy theories, what they really mean is theories like the inside job theory. That's a conspiracy theory in the ordinary sense. In contrast, I think it would be distinctly odd to describe the 9-11 Commission as proposing a conspiracy theory about 9-11. So that, that's, that's my kind of guiding thought. And, and it's an interesting thought, I believe, because, of course, it's true that both of these theories blame 9-11 on a conspiracy. Right? So a conspiracy is where you have a group of people work, working together in secret to do something illegal or harmful. So both of these theories blame 9-11 on a conspiracy. Right? So, in, so, in, so in that sense, they're both theories about a conspiracy. And yet... I think ordinarily we would be reluctant to describe the official view as a conspiracy theory. It's the inside job theory that is a genuine conspiracy theory. So why is that? Why is that? So, so here's a point that the um, psychologist Rob Brotherton makes, which I think is an important and, and kind of basic point, which is that when people call something a conspiracy, they're not just talking about any old conspiracy. Okay, if, 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 if a conspiracy theory were any old theory about 9-11 a conspiracy theory, but we don't call the official account of 9-11 a conspiracy theory. Uh, so I think that's evidence in support of Brotherton's point. Um, so I think it, in order to just kind of avoid a lot of confusion about what we're talking about when we talk about conspiracy theories, I want to distinguish between a very broad sense of conspiracy theory and a much narrower, stricter sense of conspiracy theory. Okay, so a, a conspiracy theory in the broad sense, so this is conspiracy theory with a, with a small c and a small t, a conspiracy theory in that sense is just any explanation of an event by reference to a conspiracy. So in that very broad sense, you might call the official view of 9-11 a conspiracy theory, um, you might say it's a conspiracy theory that 
a bunch of people conspired to assassinate Julius Caesar. On the other hand, there are conspiracy theories in what I take to be the strict and indeed more interesting sense. So these are capital C, capital T conspiracy theories. So what I want to say is that only the inside job theory is a capital C, capital T conspiracy theory about 9-11. And that's the type of theory that people have in mind when they call something a conspiracy theory. And if you ask me, well, which people? I, I mean, you know, all, uh, so, so that's the kind of key distinction that you need to get hold of, right? So it's the distinction between small c, small t conspiracy theories, which are just theories about uh, conspiracies, and big c, big t um, conspiracy theories. Um, okay, so so I've talked. So, so that's the 9/11. That's what I'm calling the 9/11 test. And I think it's I think it's a, it's it's a, it's useful actually to think about the official report of the 9/11 Commission, and it's useful to think about why it would be so weird to call that a conspiracy theory. And why would it be so weird to say that the, the official report is proposing the conspiracy theory that Al Qaeda Okay, so I've talked about 9-11. Um, let me just give you some examples of a, a whole bunch of other um, uh, conspiracy theories, some old and some new. Uh, and and um, the significance of this list will become clear as we, as we go along. But okay, so first of all, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the most notorious, most famous conspiracy theory of all time. Uh, so this is a theory that dates back to the early part of the 20th century um, about a, a, a secret meeting of Jewish elders Plotting a um, uh, plotting world domination, to put it crudely. Uh, so this was a theory that was taken up by the Nazis. Um, was was taught as historical fact in schools in Nazi uh, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, and is still taught as historical fact in some places in the world. Then there's the Great Replacement, which is that there's a conspiracy uh, by the, by members of the liberal elite to replace the white Christian population of Europe with immigrant Muslims. Uh, the Soros migrant caravan. So George Soros uh, was supposedly responsible for uh, a large-scale illegal immigration into the United States. Um, QAnon, uh, senior Democrats are plotting, uh, uh, running a child pedophile ring um, in, uh, uh, in, in the US. Uh, Sandy Hook, which is uh, that uh, um, a school shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School was a false flag. There are conspiracy theories about Obama's birthplace, but Obama was supposedly born in Kenya. And then there are conspiracy theories about the moon landings. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll come back to that list in, in, in a bit. Um, so, the, so these, I, I want to say, are all examples of big C, big T conspiracy theories. Um, okay, so, so why do I want to say that? So what's so special then about big C, big T conspiracy theories? So here are three features of these theories. So first of all, I want to say that each of these theories has a political agenda. Now, when I say that they have a political agenda, I don't just mean that they have political consequences or that they have political significance, which of course they do. What I want to say is that these theories are in essence, and that is their core function. Now, when I talk about function here, I'm talking about function in a, in a, in a kind of technical sense. So if you think about the function of a bodily organ like the heart, uh, the function of the heart is 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 specified by 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 saying what the heart does, namely pump blood. Okay, so yeah, so so uh, when I talk about the function of something, I'm talking about it's it's uh, the job that it does. Uh, and in the case of big C big T conspiracy theories, I want to say that their that, that their basic job, that the fundamental um, job that they do, is to uh, um, advance a political agenda, either in favor of something or against something. So if you go back to the list that I gave before, just ask yourself, so what's the political agenda of each of these theories? So here's a kind of very crude answer to that question. Uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, anti-Semitism. The Great Replacement, anti-immigrant, anti specifically anti-Muslim. The Soros mi Migrant Caravan, um, anti-immigrant. Anti uh, 
QAnon, well, that is a sort of meta conspiracy theory that combines a whole lot of other conspiracy theories. At, 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 um, but certainly um, you could describe it as anti-liberal elite uh, or anti-democrat. Sandy Hook, uh, what's the political agenda there? Um, opposition to gun control. Obama's birthplace, delegitimizing the um, um, and 9-11, um, anti-state, an, anti anti-federal government, anti-Bush. Okay, so in each of these cases, there's a fairly obvious uh, political agenda, which you don't really need to be a genius to work out. And that, I want to say, is one of the kind of key features of big C, big T conspiracy theories. Uh, in contrast, a historian who writes a book about conspiracies in ancient Rome against Julius Caesar, a historian who does that isn't pushing a political agenda. That's not the function of a historical theory about a, a conspiracy. conspiracy theories. These theories are contrarian. That is to say, they are contrary to the official view or to what you might call the received wisdom. Now that, I think, is the most straightforward way, the most obvious answer to the question, why is the report of the 9-11 Commission not a conspiracy theory? Answer, because it's not contrary to the official view. Why isn't it contrary to the official view? Because it is the official view. So, so this, is, this is a kind of key feature of conspiracy theories. There are, they are contrary. I mean, another way to describe this would be to say that that, that conspiracy theories are, are, are in this sense are, are also anti-establishment theories. Uh, they're anti-establishment in some sense. Um, and um, uh, you can't call the official report of the 9-11 Commission anti-establishment. Um, a third feature of um, these conspiracy theories, uh, and this is a this is a feature that is, that, that um, is pointed out by a guy called Jovan Byford in a very, very good book on conspiracy theories that was published about 10 years ago. And he says that conspiracy theories belong in what he calls a tradition of explanation. Um, that is to say, conspiracy theories have a common uh, narrative structure, they have a common logic, and they have certain common motifs and tropes. And this accounts for something that Byford points out, which is that a lot of conspiracy theories seem very similar. They all um, they have a very similar structure. Uh, they propose very similar exp explanations. So, so many of these theories are theories about um, uh, elites, global elites, um, um, the powerful um, conspiring in some way against the people, right? So that's that's um, uh, what Byford has in mind when he talks about uh, the conspiracy, conspiracy uh, theories belonging in a tradition of explanation. And this tradition that Byford is describing really goes back to the protocols of elders of the elders of Zion. So, you know, I mean, in a way, a, a lot of modern day conspiracy theories are just variations on or adaptations of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, okay, so there are three features of um, uh, big C, big T conspiracy theories. I'll have, I'll give you some more features um, in a minute, but I do want to just focus on this Byford point, which I, I think is important. Um, and this is, this is, I, I think, a really key historical fact about conspiracy theories that um, is not emphasised nearly enough uh, today. Uh, which is that for a substantial proportion of its history, the conspiracy tradition was dominated by the idea of a Jewish plot to take over the world. So that is the basic, um, and uh, it, it, it seems to me that, that, that this, is, this, is a, this is a really fundamental fact about conspiracy theories. Now, now today, modern day conspiracy the theorists and theories are, are less overt in their antisemitism. So instead of talking about the Jews, they, they tend to talk about globalists or financiers or rich bankers. Um, these are code and understood as code. Um, and uh, so one way to make the point here would be to say that, that, that you know, if you think of the protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, 
anti-Semitism is the original sin of conspiracy theories. I'm not saying that um, all conspiracy theories are anti-Semitic, that clearly wouldn't be true. However, even conspiracy theories that are not overtly anti-Semitic are nevertheless operating in an ideological space with a long anti-Semitic tradition. Now, this notion of an ideological space is worth thinking about. Uh, okay, so an ideological space is, 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 is a kind of explanatory space. It's a space in which um, um, certain assumptions are made, certain frameworks are employed uh, to explain uh, political events. Uh, and this space, this structure of explanation is one that has, as Byford points out, a long anti-Semitic tradition. Okay, so, so just to recap then, just to go back to the previous slides, so I'm saying that the big C, big C conspiracy theories um, have a political agenda. Uh, I want to say that they are contrarian of explanation, which um, has a long anti-Semitic tradition. All right, so, so um, one of the um, consequences of, of what I've just been saying is a political consequence or a political implication. So, so it's no accident, I think, um, that many of the conspiracy theories that, that um, I was looking at earlier, not all of them, but many of them um, are theories that are extremely popular on the extreme right. Um, that isn't true, I guess, of 9-11, of, of, of but it certainly is true of uh, most of the other uh, theories that I listed on the, the second slide, particularly uh, The Great Replacement. So in a very good book called Hate in the Homeland, Cynthia Miller Idris uh, makes this point about conspiracy theories underpinning um, uh, the modern far right and helping these ideas enter the mainstream. And many of the theories that um, I listed earlier are either implicitly or uh, overtly racist theories. I mean, so if you go back to that earlier list, uh, the protocols, racist, the great replacement racist, Soros racist, uh, Obama uh, conspiracy theory is certainly racist and, and arguably QAnon as well. Uh, Sandy Hook and the moon landings are the two that I think are not racist, but it is interesting that how many of these theories are racist theories. And um, the, it's also interesting to note how uh, influential they are on the extreme right. I'm not saying that um, uh, conspiracy theories are unique to the extreme right, of course they're not, uh, but they are hugely influential on the extreme right. Um, and as Shane mentioned earlier, I have a book coming out soon on extremism and there are all sorts of interesting connections, I think, between um, ex the, what I call the extremist mindset and um, conspiracy thinking. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, there are, of course, also far left conspiracy theories, and there are also Islamist conspiracy theories. Um, uh, but these actually have quite a lot of, in common with far right theories. So Islamist conspiracy theories today um, tend to be anti Semitic, uh, and that is something that they have in common with far right conspiracy theories and a number of far left conspiracy theories also share the anti-Semitism of far right and Islamist conspiracy theories. Now, when I talk about the political agendas of conspiracy theories, one thing that people sometimes say to me is, well, surely it's not true that all conspiracy right wing. Um, so people sometimes talk, uh, tell me about uh, conspiracy theories about the disappearance of Elvis, uh, well, what's uh, what's political about that? Um, so surely you can have apolitical conspiracy theories. Well, yes, you can have apolitical conspiracy theories, but I want to make two points about these. First of all, I want to say that apolitical conspiracy theories are relatively peripheral. Um, they certainly lack the political influence of the various theories I listed earlier. Uh, and the second thing I want to say is that these um, so-called apolitical conspiracy theories function as kind of gateway drugs. They're gateways to more toxic. Uh, I, I mean, they suck people into this conspiracy tradition. And once you start investigating one conspiracy theory, for example, about the uh, disappearance of Elvis Presley, you very quickly end up um, being offered a whole lot of other conspiracy theories. So um, 
I don't think that the point about the existence of apolitical conspiracy theories is hugely significant in relation to my central thesis. Um, all right, so now let's move on to the epistemology of conspiracy theories. I've said a lot about the, the, the politics of these theories, but what about their epistemology? Um, so here are some, uh, I think, elementary reflections about these theories. So first of all, uh, these theories are resistant to correction on their own terms. What I mean by that is that they're not theories that people who put them forward, there's contrary evidence or there is no evidence in their favor. So um, uh, typically, even if you do come up with evidence against one of these theories, um, the existence of this evidence will simply be regarded as part of the conspiracy. Um, so uh, that's the sense in which these theories are uh, resistant to correction. Another, another label that's used here is to say that these theories are self-sealing. Um, uh, there is, is that they're either totally baseless or at best highly speculative. And what I mean by highly speculative is that they're all about connecting the dots, so-called based on conjecture, and supposedly errant data. So let's just consider this distinction between totally baseless and highly speculative. So I, I'm prepared to grant that, that um, um, uh, conspiracy theories about, for example, the Kennedy assassination are highly speculative. I mean, what I mean by that is that, I mean, you can see how somebody might end up um, being seduced by uh, theories about the Kennedy assassination. Uh, and, and there the thought is that there are supposed an anomalies, things that don't quite fit, um, and, and dots which, if, uh, if connected, supposedly point to a, a conspiracy to assassinate Kennedy. Um, but, of course, there are also conspiracy theories that are totally baseless. And, and I want to just emphasize this point. Conspiracy theories that are complete and utter fabrications and where calling them speculative, uh, I think is grossly misleading. Um, uh, I, I think QAnon is like that. Um, um, it, it's not as if it's not as if, you know, there is kind of some data in support of that theory, which you could, you know, you could put together to, to come up with something vaguely coherent. You can't. Uh, what about the protocols of the elders of Zion? Right. Uh, if somebody were to say to me, well, it's just, it's just a piece of speculation that there was a meeting of Jewish elders to plot world domination. I want to say, no, it wasn't just a piece of speculation. It's just nonsense. It's total crap. Right. So, so one way to put it, a more polite way of putting it would be to say that, that in the case of these totally baseless conspiracy theories, they are not even candidates for truth. And it would be absurd to say that, well, it might be true, it could have been true, that um, there was a plot as described in the protocols of the, of, of the Elder Society. I'm not saying that, the, that what the protocols say is logically impossible, what I, but what I'm saying is that um, its propositions are not serious candidates for truth. And in this sense, I think it's misleading to describe these theories as speculative. That's, I think that's that even that is granting too much to these theories. Um, I'd actually want to say the same thing about the um, conspiracy theories about the Sandy Hook High School shootings, right? So just to remind you, 2012, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, some guy uh, shoots his mother, uh, drives to the school and kills, uh, murders 20 uh, children and six teachers. Um, so uh, very soon afterwards, people start circulating the theory that the whole thing was a false flag. Um, it, it was a false flag operation carried out by people on behalf of the Obama administration in order to promote greater gun control. Um, that is utterly baseless. It is that, uh, that is not something that is a is serious candidate for truth. It isn't just speculation. It's rubbish. Okay, so that's what I want to say about the epistemology of conspiracy theories. Um, uh, so moving on, um, uh, there's just one more thing. Now, now this, next, uh, this next distinction that I want to draw um, 
is 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 going to become important as I as I go along. So let me just introduce it right away. And this is a this is the distinction between producers and consumers. So when people talk, why do people believe them? Um, but I think that we need to be careful here to distinguish between the people who invent and propagate conspiracy theories and the people who, as it were, consume conspiracy theories invented by other people. So whoever came up with the protocols of the elders of Zion, I want to say, uh, and, and in fact, it appears to have been a member of the uh, uh, Russian secret police who did it, uh, whoever, in any case, the relevant person was, he was a conspiracy theory producer. Um, whoever came up with the uh, Sandy Hook conspiracy theory, uh, he was or she uh, was a conspiracy theory producer. Now, these are people who I want to call uh, uh, conspiracy entrepreneurs. Uh, so that's a label that Cass Sunstein uses. So these are conspiracy entrepreneurs. So these are people who profit either financially or politically from conspiracy theories. And that is a fundamental fact about these conspiracy entrepreneurs. So when I say they profit politically, what I mean is that um, they, the conspiracy theories that they produce are ones that um, advance their own political objectives. So if you are hotly opposed to greater gun control in the US, then saying that the Sandy Hook shootings were a false flag uh, is going to um, advance your political right. There would be no argument for greater gun control if you think that the Sandy Hook shootings never happened. When I say that um, uh, conspiracy theory produces profit financially from their theories, well, you only really need to look at the InfoWars website um, uh, in, in the States to see what I have in mind. These are basically merchandising um, sites. Uh, a large amount of merchandise is, is, is sold on the back of conspiracy uh, theories uh, um, and, and, and uh, promoting these theories can be highly profitable. And indeed, there is um, evidence that, that some individuals have, have, have profited from, um, from their conspiracy theories. Now, the key point about this is, is the following. You don't need to suppose that conspiracy theory producers believe their own theories. Right? So, so when people ask the question, why do people believe conspiracy theories? Supposing you ask the question, why do conspiracy theory producers believe conspiracy theories? And I want to say that you don't need to suppose that they do believe their own conspiracy theories. Right. So did the person who invented the protocols of the elders of Zion believe that the theory was actually correct? I think there's no reason to suppose that, whatever. Um, uh, what about um, uh, um, uh, David Icke's uh, um, so-called conspiracy theory um, about um, uh, uh, lizard-like creatures dominating the world? Uh, does he believe that? Uh, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but you certainly don't need to suppose that he believes it in order to understand why he might promote that theory. Um, so, so that's the first thing um, um, I, I, I want to say. Now, in response to this, one, one thing that people sometimes say to me is, well, doesn't this just go to show that you're a conspiracy theorist? Aren't you just a conspiracy theorist, theorist about conspiracy theorists? Well, if I am, uh, <laughs> then presumably conspiracy theories shouldn't have any problem with it. Um, uh, but I, I think the more serious answer to this is that um, I don't take um, um, I, I don't take what I'm saying about um, conspiracy theory producers um, to have the same epistemological status as the theories that these producers themselves put forward. Um, moving on to um, the people who consume conspiracy theories. Now, so these are so-called conspiracy theories. Um, now, here the question: Why do why do consume, uh, conspiracy theory pertinent? But even here, I think we need to be somewhat careful because there are lots of different ways of consuming a conspiracy theory. Um, you can retweet a conspiracy theory. You can express an interest in it. You can speculate about it. That doesn't mean that you necessarily believe it. I'm not saying that people don't believe conspiracy theories. 
But I am saying that we just need to be a little bit careful before jumping to the conclusion that people ought necessarily believe the theories that they discuss. Okay, so I now want to move on to the psychology of conspiracy theory. I've talked about politics, I've talked about the epistemology, I now want to talk about the psychology. Um, so uh, there's a lot to be said about this, but in essence, just to kind of boil it down to a nutshell, explain belief in conspiracy theories by reference to cognitive biases and or personality traits. Okay, so, so, so psychologists say that human beings have certain cognitive biases um, that make them more vulnerable to the belief in conspiracy theories. And they want to say that some people have what they call a conspiracy mentality that predisposes them to believe conspiracy theories. Um, uh, all very interesting. Um, but, but there's one thing that, 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 that the psychological approach doesn't really tell us. It doesn't tell us which particular conspiracy theories, conspiracy theory consumers will endorse, promote or retweet and so on. And so it's all very well talking about the conspiracy mentality, but that isn't going to tell us why some people believe some conspiracy theories and other people believe other conspiracy theories. And, 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 and it seems to me that to, to really understand um, which particular conspiracy theories people end up believing, you really need to look at their broader political, um, political agenda. So, it, um, so, so if you think about um, uh, Adolf Hitler, notorious conspiracy theorist, so, uh, so Hitler believed uh, um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, why did Hitler uh, believe this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory? Was it because he had cognitive biases? Was it because he had a conspiracy mentality? Well, no, he believed the protocols of the Elders of Zion because he was a Nazi, right? That's just what you'd believe if you're a Nazi. That's a political, not a psychological explanation of belief in, uh, in conspiracy theories. Why do white supremacists believe in the great replacement? Do they all have the personality uh, trait, um, the, the so-called conspiracy mentality? Do they suffer from cognitive bias more than the rest of us? Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But the obvious explanation for why they believe in the Great Replacement is that, well, they're white supremacists, and that's part and parcel of white uh, supremacist ideology. Um, so I want to just now, in the last few minutes, just say a little bit about um, uh, the philosophical accounts of conspiracy theories. Um, so the account that I put forward is very different, I think, from the account of conspiracy theories that many philosophers um, put forward. So here's just an explanation of an event which cites a conspiracy as a salient cause. Uh, so for dentists, conspiracy theories are just theories about conspiracy. So notice that there's nothing here at all about the difference between big C and small t conspiracy theories. So, for, so, so that seems to me to be a, um, a, an important point about dentist theory. And he says, when appraising a conspiracy theory, we have to assess it on its particular, that is to say, its evidential merits. Well, yes, that sounds like, uh, like, like common sense, uh, but it seems to me to be rather an odd thing to say about, for example, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. We have to, we have to assess it on its evidential merits. Um, I have a similar concern about um, the view of another philosopher called Rachel Fraser. Um, who says that um, what conspiracy theorists worry about is not having false beliefs. They're perfectly comfortable with having lots of false beliefs. What they fear, what they worry about is missing out on true ones. So there might be some truth out there which they are missing, which they'll miss out on if they are not um, conspiracy um, theorists. So conspiracy theorists might correctly assess that the evidence for a particular theory is weak but take it that even weak evidence makes the belief um, um, a, a risk worth taking. Okay, so so um, so here then I think are four mistakes that um, a lot of the uh, literature on conspiracy theories theories make, and I think that these are mistakes made by the two philosophers I've just been discussing. Um, 
uh, as well as as well as some others. So these are what I think are the four big mistakes in lots of discussions of conspiracy theories. Number one, I think it's just a mistake to operate with an undifferentiated notion of a conspiracy theory. There is a, a distinction between big C, big T conspiracy theories and small C, small T conspiracy theories. And if you operate with an undifferentiated notion of a conspiracy theory, you will end up lumping together both the inside job theory and the official report of the 9-11 Commission, and that is a mistake. Uh, secondly, I think it's a mistake to see conspiracy theories primarily in epistemological rather than political terms. In my view, conspiracy theories are fundamentally political. Uh, I think it's also a mistake to claim or imply that anti-Semitic and other toxic conspiracy theories that are not serious candidates for truth should be considered on their evidential merits as if they could conceivably have evidential merits. Uh, it seems to me to be an absurd thing to say about um, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories or other racist conspiracy theories that they should be considered on quote their evidential merits. There aren't any. Uh, and similarly, I think it's a mistake to suggest that there is even weak evidence for conspiracy theories like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, or that people who consume these theories are motivated by a fear of missing out. Uh, that seems to me to be an absurd view of um, a good number of the conspiracy theories I was discussing um, earlier. Okay, so there are, I, I think, four mistakes that people make in thinking about conspiracy theories. Um, I mean, here's one way of putting it. Uh, epistemologists epistemologize conspiracy theories. Psychologists psychologize is to, is, to, is to grasp the point that when we talk about conspiracy theories, we are really talking about something that is fundamentally political. Okay, um, uh, so what should we do? If you, um, uh, if you, uh, accept what I've been saying so far. Um, how should we uh, respond to conspiracy theories? So, so here are four suggestions about an appropriate response. And I won't have time to go into this in great detail, but just very quickly. So first of all, I think that um, it's best to concentrate on people who are conspiracy curious, but not yet fully committed. Uh, in my own experience, people who are fully committed conspiracy theorists are, uh, are not going to be convinced, I think, by my arguments or anyone else's. Uh, the only arguments that they accept or are convinced by are the arguments put forward by other conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theorists and the data that they produce, uh, and very mistrustful of um, official sources of information. So they operate with what I'm calling an epistemological double standard, and I think that's something that's worth bringing out. Uh, I think it's also worth concentrating on exposing the harms done by big C, big T conspiracy theories and, and outing their political agendas and their history. Not enough is known, not enough is understood about the history of conspiracy theories. Not enough is understood, for example, about the role of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in, a, in, in the Holocaust. And I think this is all stuff that needs to be better understood and better known. And the last piece of advice, which is always to ask um, the question, what's in it for the conspiracy theorists themselves? So they like the question, um, who benefits? We should ask the same question um, about them. And when we ask that question about people who promote uh, extremist conspiracy theories, uh, it's fairly obvious that the, um, um, the, 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 the benefits um, are at least partly political and in some cases also financial. Okay, I said something about all four of the questions that I started out with. So here's a kind of simple take home, kind of take home message. Um, when you think about conspiracy theories, always, 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 think about the political agenda and whether if you are tempted by these theories, whether you are willing to be associated with their, uh, with their, with, with their agendas. A good number of the theories I've been discussing are theories that promote repellent extremist ideologies. And that I think is a very good reason for not buying these theories. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. And um, yeah, I've written about this in my book, Conspiracy Theories. Um, 
which I hope you'll read. Thank you so much, Tassim. Um, that, that was wonderful. Um, apologies to our to our viewers for the, the Wi-Fi chopping uh, every so often. Uh, we, 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 we'll investigate any associated conspiracies, whether they are with a small C or a large one, but we, <laughs> we, we do our best on that front. We've had um, a wonderful response to your talk. Uh, Kasim, lots, lots of great uh, questions that have come through from, from the audience. And perhaps it's unsurprising that uh, many of them, uh, such as uh, those from Maria Flood and Dieter uh, Langernecker, are, are about COVID-19 and the, the vaccines in that area. Uh, Maria asks, what do you think about the COVID-19 vaccine conspiracy theories and the impact it will have? If you have a comment on that, perhaps. Um, yeah, so this is a really kind of complicated question, right? So, so um, it seems to me that, you know, going back to the question about, you know, the political, political agenda, um, so I think people who put forward COVID-19 conspiracy theories are often promoters or subscribers to a whole bunch of other conspiracy theories. Um, uh, in the case of COVID-19, there's a kind of obviously a, a, an anti-big pharma uh, political agenda. Uh, there's also, uh, I, I, I think, a kind of anti-elite agenda. So all the stuff about Bill Gates. Um, uh, so, so I, 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 I think that they fit in to that extent with what I've been saying about conspiracy theories. However, and this is this is the kind of I think the complicating factor. I don't want to say that everyone who is vaccine hesitant is a conspiracy theorist. I think there are perfectly respectable reasons why somebody might be vaccine hesitant um, without being a conspiracy theorist. Right? I mean, so, so someone who says, I'm not gonna have the vaccine because um, I'm not convinced that there won't be after effects or the, or the trials have been too quick or, what, or, or whatever. I mean, um, I, I, I just don't see that that has anything at all to do with being, um, being a conspiracy theorist. I don't, want, I don't want to denigrate everyone who's vaccine hesitant as a conspiracy Theorists, although I think they certainly are conspiracy th theorists in that in in the in the anti 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 vaxxer community, and I would be astonished if people who, who who defend those conspiracy conspiracy theories don't also defend a whole bunch of other um, political uh, politically motivated conspiracy theories. Mm. Well, there's your your acid test, I suppose, is to ask them perhaps questions about other things and see do they reveal. Their, uh, their conspiratorial nature. Um, I suppose if a follow on on that, um, if, if somebody in your family or perhaps someone who you love uh, is you know, kind of listening to those views and perhaps adhering to them, consuming them as you describe them, um, but they themselves are, are by no means a conspiracy theorist, what, what can you do uh, to, to perhaps uh, pull them in the direction uh, that you'd like to, uh, to, to bring them toward, away from that conspiratorial view? Um, I, 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 th I, th I would really want to get to the bottom of um, their concerns. Uh, and, and as I was saying earlier, I, I think there are, there are more or, and, and less legitimate concerns. So, so if what's really driving them is, for example, extreme risk aversion, um, well, then one would need to have a conversation about the comparative risks of being vaccinated versus the versus not being vaccinated. So I, I so I think that that's a sort of conversation one could have. But if if what's driving them uh, is 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 a genuine you know is a genuine conspiracy theory, um, one would then need to have a conversation with them about what the underlying political um, uh, assumptions are, what the political motives are. Uh, uh, if they if they if they um, could have concerns about big you know big pharma, well why why do they why do they take other medications for example if they're concerned about um, um, medical advice, well you know why do they why do they take other medical advice why why are they suspicious in this in this in this particular uh, case but not in other cases um, and and you know we'll have to see, one would have to see how the conversation goes from there. Um, I, I don't think it's helpful. In, in, in the anti-vaxxer case to, to kind of go on the offensive in the way that I was doing in, 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 my, in my presentation, right? Because I think if somebody starts spinning a kind of racist conspiracy theory to me or an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, I think that calls for a completely different, resp different response um, from, 
you know, the cases that we're discussing um, at the moment. Yeah, I, I think that you, you've made that point very well. Another question is from one of the uh, professors involved in Peritia from, from Gloria uh, Origi. Um, and, and Gloria, she thanks you for your wonderful presentation, which is always good to hear. And she said she's wondering about the, quote, totally baselessness, end quote, of conspiracy theories. She points mm. out that the moon landing conspiracy theories had accumulated a huge amount of evidence against the moon landing, such as the impossibility of leaving a print on the moon because of gravity, the absence yeah. of wind on the moon, etc. So they spend mm. time to find, you know, as they would see, a plausible evidence in order to mm. justify their theories. And, and mm. thus, are all conspiracy theories baseless? No, no. So, so, so that that so th this is a really good and very difficult question, right? So. What I, was trying, what I was trying to get at, um, uh, what I was trying to get at is that, as, as your example of the moon landing just illustrated, that there are conspiracy theories where people make a serious attempt to come up with evidence in, in support of them, in the form, usually in the form of anomalies of one sort or another. Right? So these are theories that where people make a serious attempt to produce arguments for them. Right, so if you think, if you go back to the old, you know, the classic, right, the classic conspiracy theories about the Kennedy assassination, all that obsessing about the so-called magic bullet, right, and endless people um, talking about the, tra the trajectory of one of the bullets that struck the president and struck Governor Connolly and whether it could have, you know, could have moved in the way that it was supposed to. So you can, even though all that stuff, I think there are answers to all those questions, you can kind of see how somebody might be persuaded by those considerations. So, 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 I, so I want to say that those are baseless conspiracy theories. Right? But if, if you're talking about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion um, or um, uh, Sandy Hook or the Great Replacement, I, I mean, in those cases, I, I, I want to say that those are, uh, those are as it were, pure fabrication. Right? I mean, um, the, 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 the Protocols doesn't, doesn't pr provide anything that even looks like uh, a, a consideration in support of it, right? It's just, it's just, a, it's just a piece of fiction. Um, now, if, I'm not suggesting that you know that there's a there's a clear cut distinction between you know having having some basis and being baseless, but I, but I it does seem to me that there is a kind of intuitive distinction. You know, and that you know certainly if you if you read some of the early stuff about about the Kennedy assassination, I mean even though I mean I think you know Oswald acted alone, right? <laughs> uh, even though I think that I I can complete I I in a way I'm quite admiring of all those geeks who spend a lot of time worrying about bullet trajectories, right? Because they were you know they were trying to approach this in a kind of scientific way, right? um, and 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 yeah I mean in a way I think that's true of some some of the 9/11 folk too. Right? I mean, you know, all this, you know, all the engineering stuff, where there is an there's an attempt to give, you know, to give to give the theory some sort of respectable foundation. But they're not all like that. I, I think, and, I, and in, indeed, I think that 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 what I'm calling baseless sort of fab fabricated conspiracy theories are, are now much more influential and much more common than than the more than the more serious type. I mean, QAnon is another example of something that's completely nuts, right? I mean, I just don't see. Um, what the basis is of that. Um, perhaps the next question from Isabella Courtney can help us with, with that distinction that you, that you, you, you know, it's, it, it seems to be a very crucial part of your thesis is making that distinction. And I suppose a lot of it comes down to, you know, as, as you said, it's an intuitive thing, which, which for a lot of people can be very uncomfortable to accept that. Um, but Isabella Courtney says, has the media and information literacy a role to play in um, in the fight against conspiracy theory, she uses capital C, capital T there, but perhaps it's in the also in the distinction between those and things that are genuine conspiracies. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah. Well, the media is really interesting in all of this. I mean, it, it seems to me that that you know that there there is you know as it were the respectable media, what you might call it, you know the establishment media, which I you know I, I mean I think doesn't 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 on the whole promote conspiracy theories and and you know ask ask the right as ask the right questions on the whole I, I don't think they're as clear as they should be um about the sort of you know ideological stroke political dimension of conspiracy theories and it would be good if there was more emphasis kind of placed on that um but if you're thinking about social media more generally of course it's notorious that you know um 
social media has has certainly enabled uh, the circulation of, of of toxic conspiracy theories, and um, uh, it, you know, it of course it has a lot to answer for. But what one does about it, I don't, you know, it, I, I I I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky it's a tricky question if you believe in free speech. And we shouldn't put it on you to, you know, just because you you've written the book to to talk and describe as you've done so well about the distinction. It, isn't necessarily her responsibility to have a response <laughs> uh, to that. Um, I, I have another question from Andrew Curtin. Um, Andrew uh, says, isn't the explanation that Hitler believed in Theory X because, of it, because he was a Nazi putting the cart before the horse? He suggests perhaps it's rather true that he was a Nazi because he believed in those things. Similarly, with your explanation that the white supremacists believe in the great replacement theory, is because they're a white supremacist. Rather, we, we label them um, because they go for those theories. Um, so it's, 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 I suppose it's a question of ordering. Is it that the people who, or Nazis go look for these things or they, they aren't, um, you know, or, or the other way around? Have you a comment on that? Yeah, well, that's a very, you know, that's a very interesting question. But I mean, it seems to me that, that um, you know, a core element of Nazi ideology was, was uh, uh, a, a kind of, you know, race theory. Right? So the Nazis mm. had had a theory of race, uh, and 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 that was that was that that was the essence of the whole thing, right? Um, now you can have that. I mean, you can have that race theory um, without being a conspiracy theorist, right? In the sense that you don't you don't you're not committed to believing the protocols of the Elder Design just because you think that the Aryans are superior to the Jews, right? So mm. um, you know, so so, so I, I think. Although I see the, I entirely see the, the force of the question, um, it doesn't seem to me to be right to attribute um, uh, the sort of explanatory role uh, to the protocols uh, in, in Nazi ideology that the question um, pre, uh, presupposes. I, I think it's much more plausible to suppose that you know Nazi ideology, of course, rested on a whole lot of different, you know, a whole lot of different stuff. Um, uh, and 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 it, it once you bought all that stuff, including Nazi race theory, uh, that would dispose you, I think, to be um, you know uh, to be sympathetic to something like uh, so, so, something like the protocols. And similarly with white supremacists, right? I mean, uh, you know, white, of course, white supremacists, of course, they are you know they also subscribe to a kind of um, you know a, a theory, a racist theory of race, right? And that's that's the that's the fundamental point. And 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 whether you think that liberal elites are, are you know are conspiring to replace the European white Europeans with Muslims, I mean that's a whole that that's not the that's not essential, I think, to the white supremacist uh, vision. So that's why I, I want to sort of do it the way around I did it, rather than the way around that your questioner was 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 suggesting. So I think it's a very good question. It's a very interesting question. Yes, I suppose Kevin Barry makes the point: Can a conspiracy theory ever succeed? where it is not confirming a pre-existing bias, is the bias an essential prerequisite? I suppose that adds on quite, quite nicely to, to that point you've just made. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to, I think of the modern era, and think, well, what happens when the conspiracy theorists are the establishment? You know, and we don't have yeah. to look too far, perhaps, to, uh, to, to see examples of it. You write about them in your book. Yeah, yeah. So, so a kind of notorious case of this was... Uh, the Bush administration actually um, a, a, apparently promoting the theory that Al Qaeda, um, uh, the, sorry, that Iraq was somehow behind or involved in 9 11. Right. So, 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 so that in, in, in the book, I had a bit of a, pro I had, had a problem with that because if you say conspiracy theories, big C, big T conspiracy theories are contrary to the official view, well, what happens if the official view is a conspiracy theory? What about all the conspiracy theories that Trump promoted, right? Mm. So, um, so that's why I say contrary to the official view or the received, <laughs> the received wisdom. Right. And and one you know one of the funny things about about both the, the Bush example and the Trump example is that the mere fact that you're the American president doesn't actually necessarily make your view the official view. Right. So, um, I mean, it's, if you think about the whole issue of whether Iraq was behind was behind nine eleven, I mean, of course, Cheney, Dick Cheney, particularly, uh, certainly tried to give people the impression that that was so. 
uh, based on you know some alleged meeting between the lead 9-11 hijacker and a member of Iraqi intelligence but all of that was looked into by the 9-11 commission and was found to be was found not to be true right so if so you know what's the official view here it's kind of hard you know it, it it's hard to say in, uh, in 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 those cases so I think the phenomenon of people in positions of power promoting conspiracy theories is an interesting it is an interesting phenomenon you know certainly um um, but I, 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 I do think, nevertheless, that there's something right about this idea that, you know, conspiracy theories sort of, you know, in essence are anti-establishment, you know, they're, they're, they're contrary to the official view. I think, I, I, I don't think it's, it's, that's really very controversial. No, I, I, I would agree. And I suppose many of those who we might describe as populist would see themselves as anti-establishment, even though they are in the position of, exactly. of, of power and it's, it's by their exactly. nature. Conscious of, of the time, and Professor Kassam has agreed to, to stay on for some extra questions, but uh, we, we have reached our, our one hour mark. And so for those of you who need to leave us now, I wish to thank you for your, your time today and to encourage you to join us for our next talk in two weeks time with Professor Michael Lynch. Um, you can read more about that on our Paratia website. Indeed, you may wish to join me in reading Michael's book, before the talk. Um, so we, we, we thank Professor Kassam uh, at this point for his wonderful talk and thank him also for, for uh, staying on a little longer to, to answer more of your questions. Thank you so much, Professor. So, um, uh, oh, I'm just reminded and it's sent out to all of you that the title of Michael Lynch's talk is The Democratic Value of Truth, uh, which, which rhymes very nicely with what we're talking about uh, just, just here. Um, so, um, uh, Kasim, I might ask you another question from, from Carrie Thur, and uh, Carrie says most of the examples of conspiracy theories you've given are from the, uh, the far right, um, but uh, do they also exist uh, for, for those who, who would, we would consider on the far left? Yeah, I mean, they certainly do. And, and, and you know, interestingly, I think the far left is very susceptible to anti-Semitic anti conspiracy theories, right? So, so um, uh, theories about you know wealthy Jewish bankers and their and their influence or the influence of Israel or American foreign policy. And so, uh, th so these are, I mean, those are theory conspiracy theories that are very popular on the uh, on on the extreme left. I mean, there are other there are other kind of left left leaning conspiracy theories that. Um, uh, are, are not are, are not uh, are, are not anti-Semitic. So certainly, um, um, you know, theories about the the the, the deep state. Um, uh, so if you think of you know the Oliver Stone film JFK, right? Which mm. I mean, it's a bit hard to say what the conspiracy theory is that Stone is pro promoting in that film. It's I don't know whether it's you know is it like is it the, was it the Cubans was it the mafia. <laughs> Was it the deep state? It seems to be some some mixture of all of those three that he's that he's pinning the Kennedy assassination on, but it's pretty clear that that Stone is coming coming at this not from a right wing perspective but from a kind of left wing perspective, right? Um, yeah, uh, I I agree, and I I also got the sense that he wanted it to be more than it was, which which is something that uh, you talk about in in the book, in that sense of the difference between the pre-modern and the modern view of things. It's like you know there must be a bigger reason for things yeah. that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just to just to kind of spell that out a little bit. I didn't, I didn't cover that in the presentation, but I, I, I think that is a kind of deep thing with, <clears throat> with conspiracy theories, which is, you know, that the, in a way they're a sort of exercise in trying to make sense of things. So this is the more respectable end of conspiracy theory. They're an exercise in, in, in um, trying to find a story that that in, in into which you can fit everything. Um, you know, the thought that very often there's something hidden behind the surface and the real meaning of these events is concealed uh, and that was really what what you know the Oliver Stone film was about you know that um, yeah, the Kennedy assassination had a meaning had a significance that wasn't obvious um, on, on on the surface and that I think is is um, part of what I'm calling the more respectable end of conspiracy theorizing and it's also a respect in which conspiracy theorizing, I think, has something in common with the religious impulse, which again is uh, has to do with the search. You know, fundamentally, I see as it's it's all about searching for searching for a deeper meaning. You know, the thought that there must be more to it than meets yes. the eye. A, a very human thing for us to do. Uh, 
Angela Long has a wonderful question. She says, if we dismiss all conspiracy theories, is there a danger that we just accept those in power, government leaders? Yeah, so, so, this is, so this is a really great question, I think, and a, and, and a very important issue. So one thing that a, a lot of people a, a attack me for is for being a kind of establishment patsy, you know, that, that, that what I'm really saying is we should just believe what the government tells us uh, and that we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be critical. Uh, I, I want to say that that's far from, far from being the case. I mean, it seems to me that there are perfectly good grounds to be critical of what governments do, of their incompetence, of their mendacity uh, and venality. These are all things that we can, we are all aware of as citizens of, de of democratic uh, societies. We all know this about our governments. Um, and, 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 and having the view of conspiracy th theories that I have, that I have does not in any way debar me from being critical of the establishment. But uh, promoting kind of bogus conspiracy theories, I think what that does is that it actually um, tends to detract from one's criticisms and making them too easy to dismiss. Uh, I mean, a good example I give in the book, which I, I kind of like, is the example of Noam Chomsky, right? Now, Chomsky is no establishment patsy, right? So here's a guy who's made his entire kind of career as a, as a, as a bitter critic of particularly uh, American foreign policy. But Chomsky is not a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, right? I mean, asked about, about that, as far as I know, Chomsky's view as well, it's absurd, right? I mean, 9-11 oh, wasn't an inside job. Why would they do that? How could they have done that? Um, but that doesn't mean that Chomsky is not a critic of the establishment. So I, so I, you know, and I think a lot of the people who were tempted by 9-11 conspiracy theories were also strongly opposed to the Iraq war and which, and they saw, you know, they, they liked 9-11 conspiracy theories partly because they saw 9-11 as a pretext for the Iraq war. So it all sort of fitted together, you know, and what I want to say is if you're against the Iraq war, be against it, right? There are perfectly legitimate reasons for being a critic of the Iraq war that do not require you to be a 9-11 conspiracy theorist or indeed any other kind of conspiracy theorist. So, um, you know, so, so don't sort of dilute the force of your anti-establishment credentials by, by dressing them up in the form of these theories, right? With all the, with all the historical baggage that these theories uh, carry with them. Yes, as I read that, I, the, the... The old maxim, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, came to mind, and the dangers oh. therein, you know? Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. I, 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 I've regularly gone to protests, uh, protest march, but I've always been really conscious about the flags of the organizations that are not too far away from me. And this is like, I suppose it's like, I'm not flying it myself, so nobody could say that's my flag, but you're walking nearby <laughs> um, and you don't wish to be too too closely associated. The, uh, the war in Iraq one comes to mind, for instance, uh, but I, I'll move on from the question um, from Michelle Cross. And um, Michelle, again, thanks you for your talk and has a small question about epistemology. Um, he asks, uh, do you conceive of resistance of correction and speculativeness as two equally necessary features of conspiracy theories. And can you concede that a conspiracy, conspiracy theory might have some small evidence in their favor and still remain conspiracy theories with a capital C and a capital T? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, um, so s speculativeness as a necessary condition for a conspiracy theory, well, no, because I wanted, I gave examples of big C, big T conspiracy theories which I, I don't want to call speculative, right? So I don't want to call the protocols of the Elder Design speculative. Hmm. Uh, resistance, <clears throat> resistance to correction, well, yeah, I mean, I guess I do think that's a necessary part of being a conspiracy theory. I mean, um, clearly conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories have a kind of interesting kind of relationship with questions of evidence, right? Because they... Um, um, certainly won't take evidence against their theories at face values. Um, now, of course, it's been philosophers of science will, will, will have been telling us for a long time that, well, scientists don't either, right? So, um, you, know, you know, scientists have their own, you know, have their own paradigm and that, you know, it, 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 evidence that conflicts with the paradigm gets dismissed as, you know, anomalous um, <clears throat> until you get a paradigm shift. Um, um, 
so, so the, I think there is, a, you know, there are quite interesting questions here about well, what's the difference between between that phenomenon, which is a, mm. which is just part of kind of ordinary science, I guess, and um, and and what I was, you know, what I was describing as the attitude of the conspiracy theorist to, you know, to to contrary evidence, um, and and I, I, I mean that would just be an incredibly complicated, complicated question, you know, um, qu question to answer, and I think it sort of fits with my sense that. Um, it's just not, it's not really going to be enough to just criticize conspiracy theories on purely epistemological grounds. You know, I think this is the mistake to say there's some epistemological error that conspiracy theories are making that is unique to them, you know, and that distinguishes them from everyone else, in particular from respectable science. And I think that can be kind of a hard case to make because, you know, science is complicated too, right? And there are all sorts mm. of you know, there are all sorts of questions that can be raised about, you know, the, the, the extent to which it, to which science is resistant to correction. Um, um, but in a way, that's just fine by, me, by, by my lights, because I want to say, well, I, you know, it isn't just about the epistemology. Actually, if you really want to understand these theories and what's wrong with them, you really need to think about the political, you know, the pol the, their politics, the political agendas that they're pushing. And that's the, you know, that's the fundamental point, not some abstract epistemological um, defect. Yes, I think that's very fair. And as you spoke, I was mindful of our, our last presentation by uh, Professor Oreskes, and she talking about the, the, the social nature of, of what makes science trustworthy is, is well, in part is the consensus that's agreed. And even around things like paradigm shifts, there, there is an element of consensus that's reached and I suppose it, it would meet your criteria for distinction between capital C, capital T, conspiracy theory, or other. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, I, and but I I felt that your your for me it was revelation that idea of well who benefits? What's the political motivation behind asking a question like this? Is a very powerful way to distinguish. Um, so I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I asked I was asked um, on the radio today to comment on a. A, a statement from a recent Trump advisor who, who said that there were far more UFOs out there than we realized. And it was left there. And I suppose there was the dot, dot, dot that came afterward, which implied yeah. he, he, he said that the government knew about things that we don't know about. You know, yeah. and, and the first thing that came to my mind was, I wonder how much money he's looking for for yeah. the jets, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's really, it's really interesting. So, so, so I, I tell you on this who, on this who benefits thing, right? So, a few weeks ago, so, somebody sent me a, a a long email, which I which which I, I is a kind of classic of its of its kind, and basically says something like, "How much money did they pay you for writing that article or for writing that book?" Right, and, and, and then the usual stuff. But but the, but the, the the point was that you know my motives had to be suspect because I had to be deriving from some financial benefit. From writing the books that I that I write, anyone who had, if you've ever written an academic book, you'll realize that's a completely spurious argument. There's no money. There's no money to be made that way. Um, but uh, so I, what I want to say is, well, we you know we should be asking the same question right? uh, mm. back back to the conspiracy theorists, right? I mean, you know, why are they saying these things? Right? One reason that people say say the things that they say is that they believe them, right? And you know, maybe that's true. Right, but but uh, it, it, certainly, if you look at if you look at you know people putting forward conspiracy theories about Sandy Hook and so on, do they actually believe these things? I don't think they do. And when they were sued by some of the some of the parents of the Sandy Hook victims, uh, and, and, you know, and were awarded you know uh, uh, the parents were awarded serious damages against some of these people. Of, um, of course, they then said, "Oh well, we didn't really believe it. We were just you know this. We didn't mean it literally." Right, uh, and I think that that you know that's one thing that there was that they said that was true. I don't think they actually did believe these theories, um, but they had you know they had ul you know ulterior motives, as I would say, for promoting these theories. So so this is a kind of general thing that I would say to anybody out there who, you know, um, is is interested in these in these theories, which is which is always to ask the question. Who is putting forward these theories? Why are they putting these theories forward? And what's in it for them? Mm, absolutely. I think it is, it's, they're wonderful tools. I, I, I move to our last question, perhaps, which follows from Stephanos. And, and you know, given you, you've, you've read so widely about so many of these conspiracy theories, can you um, 
point to a, a killer ingredient in one, one that, that makes them, you know, in, a very, very hard to dismantle um, or to tackle. In other words, a very successful conspiracy theory. What, what is that killer ingredient? Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so there are successful small t, small uh, c conspiracy theories. So the killer ingredient they have is evidence. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so uh, of course, look, if you read a history book, I mean, history books are full of full of tales of conspiracies, right? And lots of these tales of conspiracies are, you know, supported by, you know, by evidence. So if you think of, you know, the, you know, Watergate, why do I think there was a, you know, why do I think the Nixon, Nixon administration, you know, uh, co you know, conspired to bug the uh, Watergate building? Well, because, you know, there's a lot of evidence, you know, there's a lot of evidence, including a source you know, including deep throat, right? A source uh, mm. uh, from within, from within the, you know, from within the government. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, that's the, the, the thing that, that, you know, theories about conspiracies, many of them do have and can have. Um, if you're talking about kind of big C, big T conspiracy theories, I think the ones that, I mean, I think, you know, I, you know, I would want to say they're all false, but, but going back to you know to the example that you that you gave about the moon landing and the and the Kennedy ones is that at least there there's some some attempt to produce an argument. It's not just you know just it's not just total bullshit like lots of these lots of these theories are. And I think that you know um, you know that's an that's an interesting thing. And I, I I don't know if how many how many people I must be one of the only people around now has actually read the Warren Commission's report on the Kennedy assassination. And you kind of realize that this stuff is really seriously complicated and that, you know, an enormous amount of trouble went into addressing all these questions about, you know, the magic bullets and, um, and you know, Oswald's doings in the lead up to, you know, in, in his time in, you know, his time in the Soviet Union and his attempts to, to hook up with the Cubans and blah, blah, blah. You know, so, so there's something, you know, I can, I can kind of see that I, you know, that there's that there's something that's bordering on respectability in these theories, even though I don't believe them. Um, mm. But they're not the ones like that. They're not the conspiracy theories I really worry about. The ones I really worry about are the, you know, the other, you know, the really toxic ones that I listed that I listed earlier. There's they have nothing going for them at all. Yes. And as you say, in in your in your book they are dangerous and so we, we we have to be able to recognize them and mm -hmm. to consider how we individually and as a society as a society respond to them and so we thank you again for your your wonderful presentation today and wish you the very best with your upcoming book which as you said is published on september 1st extremism a philosophical analysis um, people will be able to find that yeah, through their regular channels, hopefully a local bookshop. Um, so, Professor Kassan, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you in two weeks time for our next lecture with Professor Lynch. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.